Amen. Amen. Well, this is uh, part two. Uh, we have already talked about the power of life that's in the tongue. Uh, we talked about in Proverbs 18.21, this is the verse. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Not might eat its fruit, not can eat its fruit. When you learn to love the power of life and death that's in your tongue, something is going to happen. Something that you can see, something tangible, you will eat its fruit. Now, we talked about the power of life that's in the tongue, which is the power of the blessing. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the power of death that's in the tongue, which is a curse. Now, in the Scriptures, there are two types of curses. There's the curse of the law, and there's a curse of maldiction. The curse of the law is addressed in uh, Galatians 3, for example. Verses 13 and 14, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Well, what is the curse of the law? Well, you know that God created Adam and Eve and had a very, very special relationship with them. He would come down and walk with them in the coolness of the garden. Uh, he did set boundaries uh, for them to live in, to have a relationship with him, and they decided to go their own way. They disobeyed God, and, and from that moment on, people have constantly turned away from the Lord. Well, God comes back to Abraham, and he says, Listen, we're going we're gonna to try this thing again, so to speak. I'm, I'm paraphrasing now. And he says, I'm going to give you uh, a set of laws that if you will obey these, you will be righteous and we will have a relationship together. And those laws actually became a curse for us because we've never been able to obey them. It's just not in our nature to be able to do so. So Christ came, did live by the law, lived without sin, died on the cross, and when he died upon that cross, not only did he die for our life, but he died so that we could be delivered from the curse of the law. In other words, he paid the price that we might receive the blessing of Abraham and that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Well, the second kind of curse in the Scriptures is called the curse of maldiction. That is a curse that is spoken. And I gave you these in your notes that the definition we looked at last week, if you remember, the blessing means to speak well of. It's the word eulogy in the Greek, the word barak in the Hebrew. It means to speak well of in order to invoke divine favor upon. We talked about how it's um, uh, a good example would be uh, when you go out to start your car tonight, that you don't have the power to make that car do anything, but you have a key. And when you go out there and you place that key in that car and you turn that ignition, you're going to invoke the power of the battery. It's going to flow through that ignition, and it's going to begin a process in that, in that motor in your car, and you're going to be able to set a course for that car on your way home. Well, we can do the same thing with the power that's in our tongue. We can call down blessings from heaven. We can speak those into a person's life that can change the course of their life. Well, the same thing is true with the power of death that's in your tongue. Cursing, uh, to be a, a, an example of a, a definition, would just be the opposite. It means to speak evil of and to invoke demonic oppression upon. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, I would never, ever, ever speak anything over anyone with the intention of invoking demonic oppression upon. Well, I'm going to here to tell you that you don't have to do it on purpose. In the book of James, and if there's one thing James makes very clear, is that his book is written to believers. I believe it's 16 times that he says brethren. He points out that he's speaking to the brethren. What makes you and I brethren? That we have the same father, amen? And here, this comes out of James chapter 3, and here's what he says. And the tongue is a fire, a world of inequity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. Now listen to this. And sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. Now what is he talking about the course of nature? 
He's talking about the whole course of someone's existence. For example, um, let's say you have a child, and uh, the opposite of blessing that child would be to curse that child. Let's say that you're sitting at the table, and this child spills their milk. And all of a sudden, you jump up and you're yelling, I can't believe you're so clumsy. How can you be so clumsy? You can't even, you can't even eat a meal without spilling your milk. And you know what? The next time you have a dinner, that child's going to spill his milk again. And the next thing you know, that child's tripping, falling down, being clumsy. Not that it was the child's nature to be clumsy, but because your tongue, look what it says, is set on fire by hell. What does that mean? That demonic powers can actually work through the words that you speak. And you have now changed the course of that child's life. A child comes home and maybe didn't make a very good grade in school. How can you be so stupid? You're never going to amount to anything. I can't believe you're that dumb. Why can't you be like your brothers and sisters and be any smarter? I can't believe. And you know what? That child's going to have a very, very hard time in school. You can set on fire the whole course of their existence. You can, listen, one of the, one of the toughest things is a person who's been beat down through words. I mean, it is almost impossible to encourage that person. It is almost impossible to convince that person that someone loves them, that someone improve, approves of them, that God loves them. I mean, it can do damage that is absolutely incredible in a person's life. You know, it's kind of interesting. I've done a lot of prison ministry, and I was at a Kroger grocery store uh, one night, and, and I saw this child acting up, and there was a police officer in the Kroger grocery store. And this mother goes, uh, you better watch out. I'll go get that police. You're going to end up in prison. That police will come and get you. And I thought, well, you know, I just thought for just for the fun of it, I would go into a prison where I had about 300 men in a service, and I would just ask them, did, were you ever told that you would go to prison before you went to prison? And did you know every man in there raised his hand? Now, I'm not saying they're all in prison just because somebody said that, but I think that's a little bit overwhelming odds. I'm one of those. Now watch this, verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Now did you catch that? We're talking about people who are one minute praising God, blessing God, and then the next minute speaking a demonic curse into somebody's life. Watch this. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, speaking to Christians, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and flesh. Fresh. Who is my, wise and understanding among you? Now you get that? Who is wise and understanding among you? In other words, who has an ear to hear what I'm, what I'm trying to reveal to you here? Let him show by good conduct. You know what that's talking about? The way you speak. As a matter of fact, when I was a kid in school, that's what they called it, a conduct grade. I don't even know if they call it that anymore. Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. See, out of a self-will comes these words. If I'm thinking of what's best for another person, if I'm walking in love, I'm not going to be speaking curses. If, if my child, as a matter of fact, Philip preached on Sunday, uh, and he used such some great, great analogies with his child, and he even spoke of that, that when his child spills something, he does not yell at his child because that's going to happen. Amen? See, if you're walking in love and you have the other person's best intentions, then you're not going to speak curses into their lives. 
But when you're wrapped up and you're wanting to invoke your will upon them or release your anger upon them, well, that wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Now, there's a great example of a man in the Scriptures that truly had to deal with some curses in his life, and his name is Job. Now, you know the story of Job. Job is a very righteous man. And uh, Satan comes before the throne of God, and God asks him, what have you been doing? He says, oh, I've been going to and fro about the earth. And uh, he says, have you considered my servant Job? And he uh, talks about how God has surrounded him with a hedge of protection, but that if he would allow him to get at Job, he would cause Job to curse him, that he would speak evil of God. And so he gives Satan a certain amount of authority in Job's life. And so Job is already dealing with what Satan is doing in his life. Remember, his children are killed. He loses everything he has. I mean, just one thing after another takes place. And then on top of all that, here come some guys over to his house, and they begin to speak the curse of maldiction upon his life. And what I really want to talk to you about in the book of Job is not only about the curse of maldiction, but how to break it. Because Job found a way out from underneath those curses on his life. And let's take a look at it. I went ahead and put these in your notes so that we don't have to go flipping through the Scriptures. And, and really, you don't have to do a long search in Job to find Scriptures that are uh, very much like the ones that I have here. I don't know how many of you have ever read the book of Job. But have, if you do, if you're like me, you start thinking, are these guys ever going to shut up? I mean, they just go on and on and on. But I'm telling you, I've seen people that I'm, you, they walk into their house at Thanksgiving and the argument from last Thanksgiving takes right back up where it left off. They just go on and on and on. Well, here's what happens. This comes out of Job chapter 11. And I'm just going to start in verse, I just start at verse 1 in each one of these chapters. It says, Then Zophar the Namathite answered and said, so they've already been arguing, Should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be vindicated? And he's speaking to Job now. He says, Should your empty talk make men hold their peace? And when you mock, should no one rebuke you? For you have said, My doctrine is pure, and I am clean in your eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against you. Have you ever done that, been in the middle of an argument, and you want to call God into it? Oh, I've, I've seen that happen quite often. And I've, I've had it happen in my nature. Oh, God, won't you just show them I'm right? You know, well, I'll pray for my enemies. Smash them, dash them, bash them, crash them, God. <laughs> well, we're going to look at how God feels about that. Amen? All right, so you're going over to Job 13, and here's Job speaking. He said, Behold, my eyes have seen all this, and my ear has heard and understood it. What you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you. Here he goes again. But I would speak to the Almighty and desire to reason with God. But you forgers of lies, you are all worthless physicians. Oh, that you would be silent, and it would be your wisdom. Now you hear my reasoning and heed the pleading of my lip. In other words, now you listen to me. I got a lot of stuff I want to say back to you. Well, then you get to Job 15, and here's Eliphaz, the Temanite. And he answered and said, Should a wise man answer with empty knowledge and fill himself with the east wind? Should he reason with unprofitable talk or by speeches with which he can do no good? Yes, you can cast off fire, fear and restrain prayer before God, for your iniquity teaches your mouth, and you choose the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you and not I. Yes, your own lips testify against you. Then we get down to Job 16, and Job answers and said, I've heard many such things, miserable comforters are you all. Shall words of wind have an end? Or what provokes you that you should answer? I could also speak as if you do, and if your soul were in my soul's place, I would heap up words against you and shake my head at you. Then Job goes off again in Job 23. He says, Even today my complaint is bitter. My hand is listless because of my groaning. Oh, that if I just knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. 
I would know the words which he would answer me. You know who he's speaking of, right, God? And understand what God would say to me. Would God contend with me in his great power? Oh, no, but he would take note of me. There the upright could reason with him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. So they keep trying to call God into this situation, and by the time you get to Job chapter 38, if you've been able to stand it that long, um, God speaks, and he tells Job exactly what he thinks. And Job gets quite a surprise. And here's what God says. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? Do you understand what God's doing here? Finally, God answers back and says, Let me tell you something, Job. You're speaking words without understanding. You don't have a clue what you're doing here. Now, you've got to remember, Job was a righteous man. God had faith in Job. God loved Job. He had him so hedged about with protection, Satan couldn't get to him from any side. Yet, when Job began to fight this battle, God had no I would say, sympathy for him. As a matter of fact, he said, Job, before we're even going to speak, you need to look at the universe. You need to come in contact and get your mind around who you're talking to. And then when you come to Job 42, we begin to see Job work his way out of this thing. And here's what it says. Then Job answered the Lord and he said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be held from with you from you you asked who is this who hides counsel without knowledge therefore i have uttered what i did not understand things too wonderful for me which i did not know listen please and let me speak you said i will question you and you shall answer me i have you by the hearing of the ear ear but now my eyes see you therefore i'd hoard myself and i repent in dust and ashes. In other words, Job says, you're right. I am handling this the wrong way. I'm ashamed of myself, and I repent. I'm going to do things differently. Now watch this. And so it was, after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Tem Temanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now, do you see what happens? All of a sudden, when Job quits fighting his own battle and he repents, what happens? Now, God begins to defend Job. Now, we're going to show you how this works in a few minutes, but I just want you to get that down in your spirit, the things that begin to change right here. Now, therefore, he's telling them what they got to do. Now, God's speaking for Job. Job doesn't have to do his own arguing anymore. Now, therefore, take yourselves seven bulls and seven rams, and you go to my servant Job. <laughs> you go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bilidad the Shuite and Zophar the Namathite went and did as the Lord commanded them, for the Lord had accepted Job. Now watch this. When Job repented, got out of the way, God began to fight his battle for him. But here's when things really began to change. Verse 10, And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. In other words, when Job quit fighting his own battle, God began to fight it for him. And then when Job stepped into what is called the second mile and began to pray for these people, he began to bless those who cursed him. Now, all of a sudden, he's restored twice of everything that he lost. So let's talk about this for just a minute. And this is what I put in your notes. God's power and authority truly flow in the second mile. 
See, we're not just talking about what the curse is tonight. I want to, here, here's, here's my goal tonight. My goal tonight is this, that if you've spoken some curses into people, you need to get a hold of your tongue. The Bible says that if we don't learn to bridle our tongue, our religion is worthless. Now, what does that word religion mean there? You know, people are so hard on religion. It's like, and religion, in the way that people are so hard on it, legalism, trusting in our own works, all those things. But that word means everything you do in order to be closer to God. Okay? So what God says is that if you don't learn to bridle your tongue, everything you're doing to be closer to me and to serve me makes no difference to me. That's how important this issue is. Okay? So I want you to understand the importance of it. I want you to understand how to break a curse if you've put one over your life. If you've spoken one into someone else's, I want you to know how to break that curse. And I want you to come out of here learning how to allow God to fight your battles. Now, that's what I'm after tonight, okay? So let's talk about God's power and authority truly flow in the second mile. Now, this comes out of Matthew chapter 5, 38 through 45. And here's what God says. Well, this was Jesus speaking. And he says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Now, that does not compute with what I was taught. <laughs> Amen. My dad always told me I'm small and he's small. He always told me, you fight fair. That's all he ever cared about. You fight, but you fight fair. Amen. If they're bigger than you, then maybe you can pick something up. Now, he never taught me this here. All right, verse 40. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Well, what was he talking about? Well, in the days of Jesus Christ, there was a law. They were under the um, uh, rule of Rome. And there was this law that a Roman soldier at any time could tell a Jewish person to carry his belongings one mile. So you could be a Jewish person and you could be out there working in your field and trying to bring in your crop and some soldier coming down the road could say, hey, come here, boy. Carry this stuff one mile. Well, so the Jews put one-mile markers everywhere. <laughs> and so what they would do is if you got called out of your field, you know, a, a Jewish guy would pick up those things, and he would carry them. He'd get that one-mile marker, and he'd throw it down and say, boy, wait till the Messiah gets here. Boy, he's going to let you have it and march off. Well, here comes the Messiah, and the Messiah says, when you get to that mile marker, I want you to go two miles. Well, what would happen in that instance? See, when, when we do what's required of us, we walk up to that mile marker, and at that point, I'm a slave. The moment that I step past that mile marker, I'm now in control of this soldier. It's up to me how far his stuff goes. It's not up to him anymore. It's all authority has been passed over to me. Can you imagine if that really happened? Can you imagine someone walking along and and uh, a Roman soldier, and he's used to this, figuring this Jew's going to throw this stuff down and curse them out and walk off. And the guy keeps walking, and the Roman soldier's going, what are you doing this for? Who's in control now? The Jewish person is. And he begins to tell him, you know that Jesus Christ? The one they crucified? Well, I want you to know you didn't take his life. He laid it down. And I'm going to tell you something. It wouldn't take long before a slave and a soldier became brothers in that situation. And that's exactly what happens to us. When Job, he did what he was supposed to do. He repented, and God got involved. Praise God. But when he stepped into that second mile, that's when the blessings were poured out upon him. Look what it says next. It says, Give to him who asked you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, in other words, if someone speaks bad of you, you speak good of them. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Now, this describes a new authority in your life. This word son is not the same word as child in the Greek. And when uh, John 1.12, for example, says, To many has received him... To them, he gave the right to become the children of God, the technos of God, 
That's like a little child. Here the word is huios. It's talking about someone who now has authority. So he's saying that when you learn to do these things, you won't just be like my little children. No, you'll be like a full-grown son with authority in your life. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I mean, I'm talking about it just your, your whole life begins to change. It's not you just begging God for things anymore. It's God trusting you with your inheritance to go out here and make a difference in this world for him. We're talking about a huge difference in your life when you learn to walk in the second mile. Now, where does this come from? Uh, Christ left us an example to follow. This comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, 20 through 23. Here's what it says. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take that patiently, this is commendable before God. Well, I went back and I looked up that word commendable. You know what it means? Praiseworthy. So if I do something wrong and I step into the first mile, I repent, I, I, I accept my cross, whatever it is, whatever payment, whatever God decides that I'm going to be chastised with or, or I have to reap what I've sown, all that's good. But the moment that I suffer wrongly and take that patiently, God begins to praise me. Have you ever praised your children? I mean, it's awesome when your child do some, does something that you're just so proud. I mean, you're just praising them. Can I tell you that God praises you? When someone does you wrong and you take it patiently? I remember my wife and I, we went on a trip and um, uh, they lost our luggage, you know. And the people with me, they were all Christians, and they just could not believe how nice I was being about it. And I thought, man, I can't believe that you'd be mean about it. You know, first of all, it's what I was thinking. But I just went in there and blessed them. I said, you know, I've been flying Delta for years. You've never lost my bags before. And just started telling them what a great job they do and and how does this work when a bag is lost? And, and I mean, you know, I ended up with my bags. I, you know, I have a feeling that when those bags on the wrong plane came back, mine went out first. Not because that's what I was looking for, but that's just how people react to the blessing. Now watch this, verse 21. For to this you were called. See, you're not commanded, you're called. Okay? In other words, we're talking about second mile stuff here. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Well, what was his example? Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. You know what revile means? To curse. When he was hanging on that cross, and he bore the curse of the law... He also bore the curse of maldiction upon his life, did he not? Remember what they said? Oh, if you're really the Son of God, come down off that cross. Oh, he could save others, but he can't save himself. Putting a crown of thorns on his head and slapping them and asking them, Who slapped you now? Prophesy and tell us. Oh, they spoke curses over him the whole time. But when they cursed him, he did not curse back. See, when he was reviled... He did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. And what Jesus Christ did, you remember what he said. He didn't just keep his mouth shut. He walked into the second mile, and he said, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And the moment he did that, he broke the curse over his life, and he gave up the ghost. Amen? <clears throat> now, if you continue to read in 1 Peter and come to chapter 3, I love this passage of Scripture. Here's what it says. It says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling, for reviling, or you could say insult for insult, or curse for curse, but on the contrary, bless them, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. That's exactly what happened to Job. The moment he prayed, he blessed the ones who were cursing him, he inherited 
a blessing. Twice of everything that he had before, and he was blessed before. Listen, when it says twice of everything, don't you know that doesn't just mean twice the houses, twice the sons, twice the cattle? Don't you know that means twice the joy, twice the revelation knowledge, twice the peace, twice the love? Don't you know it meant twice of everything? Everything Job had, he inherited a blessing. Amen? Double everything. Now watch this. For he who would love life and see good days. Now how about you? I mean, we're going to be on this earth so many days, right? Do you want to love your life? I mean, we're going to be here. I'd like to love my life. I want every day to be a good day. And he tells you, for, in other words, this is how it happens, for he who would love life and see good days, let him go to college and open his own business. No. What's it say? You want to love life? You want to see good days? This is how easy it is. You want to love life and see good days? Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. You know, if you continue to read there, it goes on to talk about how uh, God's ears are open to the prayers of the righteous, but his face is against those who do evil. It's just like what happened with Job. Here's Job. He's a righteous man, but as long as he's spitting back curses at each other with his buddies... God's looking the other way. They keep calling on him. He doesn't answer. And then when he does, he's not sympathetic. How many people are arguing and cursing and fighting with other people and just, I mean, convinced that if God came down right now, he'd vindicate you? And the whole time, God's looking the other way, waiting for you to figure this thing out. Amen? Proverbs 26, 2. Here's what it says. Like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause shall not light. All right? So in other words, there's something that causes a curse to do the things that it does. Now, we talked about in the last lesson about how when um, Isaac was blessing, well, he meant to bless Esau, and Jacob stole the blessing. And after he realized that he had blessed the wrong person, Isaac came in and said, Oh, bless me, even me also. And you remember what Isaac said? Isaac said, Where is the one who hunted game? For I have blessed him, and indeed he shall be blessed. In other words, I can't take it back. This thing is irrevocable. There, there's, there's no way to stop what I've spoken in this person's life. He spoke of it as though it was an entity of power within itself. Well, here we see that the curse is the same. It's like a flitting sparrow. It's like a flying swallow, but it is not irrevocable. Isn't that good news? See, because a curse without cause shall not light. Well, why is the blessing irrevocable, but not the curse? Because the blessing is backed by the power of God who is more powerful than the fire of hell that backs the demonic curse. Good is more powerful than evil. Light is more powerful than darkness. So if you realize that you have spoken a curse into someone or it's been spoken to you, the good news is tonight it can be broken. Now, first of all, we need to understand a curse without cause shall not alight. What causes a curse to alight? Well, because God is more powerful than the devil and good is more powerful than evil, a curse has to have something demonic to land upon. In other words, if I, if I am arguing with you and you have hatred towards me, resentment towards me, l listen, you've got to get this about your children. Do you know that when you raise your hand at your child, there's fear in that child's heart? Okay? It's the perfect place for a curse to alight. If there's anger in the child's heart or in another person's heart, see, that's what causes one to light. It can't light a light on something godly. Talking about a flitting sparrow, a flying swallow. Remember, remember Noah when he was in the ark? And Noah wanted to know, was there land out there? Well, he didn't sling a duck out the window. Right? Because it would have had something to light upon that was familiar. He threw a dove out the window. Why? Because if a dove can't find something to light upon, what does it do? It comes back. 
So a person speaking curses, if it doesn't have a place to alight, what happens to that curse? It comes back upon them. All right, Romans chapter 12. Here's what it says. Repay no one evil for evil. Boy, you'd think we would get this. God says it so many times. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. So see, God is not unrealistic. He tells you that there are times that you may not be able to live peaceably with all men. I mean, if someone comes busting through my door tonight, wielding a gun, shooting at my family, I don't have time to bless him. Okay? I mean... There are times that people can be so demonic they don't respond to anything. Although I can tell you testimonies. Remember the man who escaped from our own jail right here in Fulton County? Killed the judge, killed a, killed a what was it, a dete- uh, yeah, sheriff, went and killed some other guy in his house. I mean, killed all these people, and he ended up at a lady's house. And what did she do? She began to bless him. And she read him the purpose-driven life. And that man let her go and turned himself in. He's not the only testimony I've seen like that. I know another man named Buck Scoggins. He went into a lady's house. He escaped from prison. He went into a lady's house. He'd been in and out of prison all of his life. And uh, he actually broke into a woman's house while she was there, and she didn't know it. And, I mean, it was one of those things like in a movie. I mean, he is in her closet while she's cleaning up the house. And the police had the dogs, and they ran the dogs, and they surrounded the house. And so Buck decided, he said, you know, this is it. I'm just going to end it. He stuck a pistol in the back of his pants, and he took a gun that he found in that lady's house, and he laid it on the kitchen table. And when the police came through the door, he was going to pull that pistol out and commit suicide by cop is what they call it. And did you know a Christian police officer walked through that door, and he said, Buck, I know you think your life's over, but it's not. God loves you, and you can still turn this thing around and began to speak blessings to him. See, that man, he was planning on killing the first one through the door. See, Buck and I, I know Buck. This is a true story. He was planning on killing the first man through the door, but that man came through the door speaking blessings. And he laid down his gun, and he went back, and now Buck has a ministry. Maybe some of you have seen all the cars with the Remember sticker on the back. That's Buck Scoggins' ministry. Remember where you were then when God got a hold of you. That's his whole ministry. Amen? All right, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, listen to this now, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now let me give you an example. Uh, Xavier, come up here for just a minute. Andy, I want you to come up here for just a second. All right, Xavier, you're bigger than me or Andy, so you stand over here, you're going to be God. Turn around, look at everybody. All right, come on, Andy. Stand right here. Stand over there. You're looking out. All right. So here's Andy. He's a believer now. Remember, we're talking to Christians. That's who James was talking about. All right? He and God are walking through life together. And here I come, and I begin to curse Andy. Now, it may be face-to-face. It could be me some little guy trying to mess with his daughter. It could be me trying to badmouth him while he's not there to take his job. I mean, there could be a lot of things, but for simplicity's sake, let's just say I attack you, all right? So when I come along and I begin to attack Andy, Andy has a choice. One choice is, is he can turn around and he can start fighting me. Now, who has he turned his back on? Because he's not doing it God's way, is he? And so here I am, and you're full of anger and everything I say is sticking to you. And I'm full of anger and everything you say is sticking to me. And you and I are just going down a path of darkness. Just down, down, down we go. And if he tries to pull God into the situation, what God going to do? Look the other way. <laughs> He's not going to do anything, okay? Until he repents. Amen? So get down on your knees right there. Now who am I fighting? Why? Because he just gave room to wrath. See, now there's room for the wrath of God to come upon me. The first thing that happened when Job repented, what did God do? He started fighting the battle. 
And then he was telling the person who was there to go to Job to find help. He put Job in control of the other guys. You follow me? Now, so here I am. I'm spitting out curses. Well, as long as he's praying for me, a curse can't land upon him. You know why? Because he's under the blood. And nothing I say is going to... Here comes a flitting sparrow. It comes, it can't land upon him. It sure ain't going to land upon him. So where does it go? It comes back to me, right? Now listen to me now. I've heard people say, now, God says pray for your enemies. How do you do that? You just do it. You just, you just go and you do it. Well, let me tell you something. I found out with something about God. If you don't mean it, he doesn't receive it. I found out there's a big difference between complaining and praying. <laughs> All right? But listen, if he has the understanding of what I'm showing you, he should literally be able to say, forgive him, Father, for he knows not what he's doing. Because he understands the trouble I'm in. I've got the wrath of God coming upon myself. I'm trying to fight God. I'm speaking curses that are sticking to me. I'm in trouble. That's why Jesus Christ could sincerely say that these people standing around this cross, they don't have a clue. And neither does anyone who's fighting a child of God that's doing the right thing. Amen? Amen. Thank you, brother. You need some help? All right. God bless you. So what's it say? It says, do not avenge yourselves. Don't fight your own battle, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him to drink. In so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. That's not the way we think of heaping hot coals of fire on the enemy's head, is it? Is to bless him. But here's the way it's what I really want you to get to. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Good and evil, light and darkness, interchangeable in the Scriptures. See, there is no way that you can overcome this light in this sanctuary with darkness. There's no button that you can turn to turn up the darkness. Darkness can't overcome the light. The only way that it's going to get darker in this building is if we turn those lights down. So when I'm a child of God and I'm walking in the light and I'm walking in love, nothing can overtake me unless I begin to turn my light down. When I start fighting my battle, when I start trying to avenge myself, what happens? Things get darker and darker and darker. See, when darkness is there, you don't want to do that. You want to turn the light up. If, if there's a battle going on between you and someone, see, you don't want to keep that battle going. It just gets darker. What you want to do is walk out of here tonight, make a phone call, and call up that person, repent, ask for forgiveness, and begin to bless that person. And next thing you know, your light will come up, and the darkness will flee out of that situation. Just the way it works. Now here, so if someone's trying to curse me, what do I do? I get out of the way. I don't fight that battle. I get down, I start praying for that person. I start blessing that person. See, God says we have to forgive someone. That's the first mile. Blessing someone is the second mile. Can I tell you that, that I found this when it comes to forgiveness? And man, forgiveness is important. God says we don't forgive the people who attack us. We're not going to be forgiven. Well, in martial arts, they teach you something. They teach you that when you want to break a board, that you don't punch the board. The way you put your fist through a solid board is you punch about four inches behind it. Four to six inches behind it. Because, see, in your mind, if your target is the board, you'll only hit the board. If your target is to go through the board, you go right through the board. It's the same way. We're, if your target is to forgive someone, you'll have a very hard time forgiving them. If your target is to bless someone, you'll fly right through forgiveness. It's like it's not even there. Because you've set your eyes in the second mile. So here's what you do. If someone's trying to curse you, you don't allow that thing to come upon you. If someone has spoken a curse in you, you turn them, stand in the mirror, and speak blessings over yourself. And if you've spoken, and listen, if you know someone has had a curse spoken over them, be part of the healing and bless that person. And if you have cursed someone, like let's say a child, and you realize, oh man, I should have never said that, that did become true, what you do, if you remember, if you go back to the blessing, there's a challenge in the blessing. What is the challenge? What is it I want to accomplish? 
And let's say that you did do that. Let's say that you told your child that they would never amount to anything. And they've never amounted to anything. What you do is you turn around and you make that the challenge. What blessings could I call from heaven to encourage this child to begin to do well? What could I speak to undo everything I've spoken? And the good news is you can break that curse. You can break that curse. And let me tell you something. If there's one that's been passed down in your family, I can't count how many people have told me, man, I grew up with my daddy yelling at my mama, and I promised I would never, ever do that. And I find myself yelling at my wife. And let me tell you something. You can break that curse. You can get down on your knees before God. You can ask for forgiveness. He will give you the grace to break that curse because if you don't, your son's going to end up yelling at his wife. And on and on and on it goes. Isn't it wonderful that God is more powerful than the devil? Isn't it wonderful that good is more powerful than evil? Isn't it wonderful that the blessing is more powerful than the curse? And now I bless every one of you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May your days be free from fear, and may you be blessed with a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. As a deer panteth for the water, I pray that your souls will long for him. May God bless you with a hunger for his word, revelation, knowledge, understand. For it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. May God bless you with a powerful spirit to overcome your flesh, that in every weakness you be made strong. May God bless you with the courage to let your light shine that men will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. May God bless everything you people touch that brings glory to his name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.